It's an absolute pleasure to be joined by neuroscience and nutrition expert Matt Jaynes this morning. Hi, Matt. Hi, morning, Adam. Good to see you. Uh, I first met you, Matt, during my time as a journalist while I was editor of Cover Magazine. And since then, you've blown my mind speaking at various industry events and with your book that Carl just mentioned titled Saving Dad, which was published in 2019. In it, you use your real life experience and your dad's battle with severe mental illness as a sort of personal case study, which describes powerfully what is possible with a greater understanding of the connection between neuroscience, nutrition and mental health. So, Matt, to start us off, why not read us a short passage from the book just to help kickstart the discussion today and give us a little bit of context? Sure. Yeah. And hello, everyone. OK, so this is for the prologue of the book. I was three years old when I first witnessed the devastating effects of depression. On a winter's morning in 1975, as I pedaled my beloved plastic, plastic tricycle into the kitchen, I saw my dad sobbing in mum's arms. Whilst being cradled, he was repeating the words, I can't, I can't. Although at the time I was too young to understand, the scene I witnessed was dad's first battle with bipolar disorder. Over the years, this mental illness has caused him to cycle between exhilarating highs and the depths of despair. Until recently, this book didn't have an ending. Since this is the true story of my life, I had to be patient enough for it to write its own. Recently, it did just that. So there's real that really encapsulates quite a lot, doesn't it, Matt? There's there's the origin uh, the sever of, the, of of your dad's condition, how you discovered it uh, as as a young child, the level of severity there, but also it suggested a a resolution. Um, and as we hinted in the in the intro to the, the the session today, nutrition played a part in that, didn't it? It did, yes, and. Um... It was actually after 40 years of psychiatry had failed to help him. Um, and by that, I'm referring to decades of electric shock therapy. So it was right at the most severe end of treatment, plus endless amounts of psychiatric medication to try and keep him out of hospital. Um, so I went searching for an answer in the scientific literature. And I found it, as you alluded to earlier, in the, the point where neuroscience and nutrition collide. Um, so, yeah, in short, diet and natural supplements uh, are what got him well and, and keep him well. And uh, in fact, I've got a little video I'd like to show everybody if that would be OK, which will help demonstrate the journey that we've been on. Please do. Come on, then. sit up. Come on, go. Come on, sit up. Come on. Come on. Push up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Otherwise, I'll have to call the nurse. How are you feeling today, Dad? Yeah, I just feel that. Um, I can't, can't, uh, just can't go on. So how are you feeling, would you say? How would you describe it? Okay, yeah. Yeah? yeah. A bit different to a month ago. I mean, that's really powerful. And so with that, what you see is the, the physical improvement as well as the mental well, wellness uh, that just wasn't, wasn't happening, wasn't a, you weren't able to achieve that using the traditional means of, of, of psych psychological support. And even mentioned in the past, um, electroshock therapy, that sort of thing. 
and, and medication. Yeah. yeah, he's had about 300 electric shocks to his brain over a period of decades. And I talk about um, in the book, the, the first chapter, which people can listen to on my website, narrate it. And I first came across the idea of ECT and then the real life example of it when I was 19. So I used to drive my dad to his appointments and uh, I learned that his father, my grandfather was treated with the same, uh, the same treatment 30 years prior to that. So yeah, it's been, it's been a very full on journey um, and with extensive medication, antidepressants, antipsychotics, uh, lithium mood stabilizers, all sorts over the decades. And it was nutrition, a nutritional diet that, that allowed him to get to that point. The point that you've seen on the video, yeah, it's absolutely. So he takes no antidepressants today at all. And that what you've seen there is, is now two and a half years of intensive individualized, that's the key, individualized nutrition to support his brain and something called the autonomic nervous system. So that's tailored specifically to, to his um, autonomic sort of setup. And we'll, we'll dig into the science behind that in, in a little bit. And I'm sure our viewers are, are really intrigued and, and curious as to find out sort of how exactly that works. Um, but you, this is not just a one-off case, is it? It's not just a miraculous um, coincidence. You know, this, this is actually based on on years and years of science, and a lot of it is is, is undiscovered. You'd say, Matt, is that is that correct? So let's take a step back. You didn't always work within neuroscience and nutrition, did you? You 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 actually, I think you were a marketer before uh, <laughs> this, and this is what's in the book as well, isn't it? You talk about your yeah. marketing career. Yes, you're absolutely right. I used to work for large corporations in London. So my undergraduate degree was in business and I worked in advertising for 12 years. And then I ran my own company, which was an e-commerce business for seven years. And my book actually charts my own personal journey alongside that of my father. And I've had my own mental health struggles, particularly depression. And my depression ended my corporate career, put a very abrupt halt to it. And this was at a time when mental health wasn't discussed at all. And HR departments just didn't know what to do. So I had no support. Um, and as I say, I, I ended up leaving the company, two companies, in fact, I tried to get back into um, the same industry and did that for another six years. But the same thing happened again. And um, what I found out is that the answer to my own mental distress was is the same that it's that's for my father. So that is nutrition. So I keep myself well today through the same approach. But, and sorry, but, I was just going to ask when, when it came to discovering the the science itself. Um, you were going to say something. I, I cut across you there. What were you going to say? Sorry. Well, it was just to say before I found the answer, I had to have a huge change of direction. So you've alluded to there with my sort of former career. So I retrained in neuroscience so that I could firstly fully understand the brain because I was so desperate to help my father. That was my motivation in the in the first instance. And beyond the brain, it was really more importantly, the autonomic nervous system, which I'm sure we're going to come on to. So it required an entire life change, a career change to unearth the science that you've alluded to. And um, what what is that science? Where where is it rooted? Um, we we haven't got long enough probably to to go into it fully, but a, a quick kind of potted history of yeah. of of what you discovered when you d did dug a bit deeper into this and, and started yeah. learning about it. Yeah, so it's fascinating. Yeah, and you you said that there's many years of evidence, and there, there are actually a hundred years of scientific evidence supporting this approach which demonstrate both how it works from a scientific perspective and in practice. And it's specifically through the work of seven pioneering doctors. And they proved the model, not only in, in science, but by successfully practicing it in their clinics. So one was a professor at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Daniel Funkenstein. Uh, as well as a practicing, practicing psychiatrist to thousands of hospitalized psychiatric patients. And he got them well using this approach. 
and another, Dr. Ernst Gellhorn, he published 400 clinical papers and nine textbooks about the autonomic nervous system and its role in mental illness. But these doctors were practicing 100 years ago and their knowledge has been lost to history uh, and replaced by really pharmaceutical medication. So I had to go on a very deep, long journey to uncover their work. And we'll come on to some of the reasons why um, the pharmaceutical industry has maybe overlooked this as a, as a solution later on. Um, but, but you keep mentioning something called the autonomic nervous system, and some of our viewers may not be aware of what that actually is. So could you actually explain what that is in, in, in simple terms? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> um, well, people already have a practical experience of this system at play in their everyday lives. And as we all sit here, our autonomic nervous system is regulating all manner of things, including our blood pressure and body temperature, so that we stay healthy physically. Um, and to achieve this, the autonomic nervous system fine tunes its two branches, and they're called the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch, to keep things nicely in balance in a state called homeostasis. And it's very well understood that physical health is maintained when we're in this state. But what isn't well understood is the same is true for our mental health. So, People get mentally ill when their autonomic nervous system is out of balance. But the good news is that it can be tuned back into balance. So one of the seven doctors I referred to, um, Dr. Gelhorn, he called this reflex tuning. And he used the interventions available to him in his day, such as tranquilizers and ECT and amphetamines, to restore the mental health of his patients by reflex tuning their autonomic nervous system back into balance. But where this gets exciting is that we can also reflex tune ourselves back into balance using nutrition, in the nutrition nutrients in food. So every vitamin, mineral, and trace element has a profound effect on the autonomic nervous system. And Everyone's got a, a unique balance in this system between these two branches, and that's genetically determined. So food and supplements need to be tailored to the, each individual and their individual biochemistry. But when we do this, magic happens. Uh, people recover from depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, actually, as well as a whole host of physical illnesses. So the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, in sort of practical terms or, or experiential terms what do they both look like so is one of them kind of a fight or flight reaction and another one more of a calm relax or is it, how do you sort of picture that yeah you're spot on actually so the familiar name of the sympathetic system is the fight or flight branch and it's perfectly designed to deal with stress it is our stress system so when you're activated whether that be in evolutionary terms by being chased by a animal or in modern day terms where you're juggling homeschooling and trying to perform your job, then that system gets activated. And then the opposing branch, and they work in reciprocity. So as one dials up, the other dials down. The other branch, what we call our rest and digest branch or repair branch, um, that needs to get activated for us to digest food and for us to sleep for immune function, so all of the restorative, restorative um, processes of the body are under the control of that branch. So we need to be spending time with that branch engaged, but the key is that some people have genetic predisposition to having a leaning away from that branch and towards fight or flight naturally, or towards the the rest and digest branch, which isn't always good. It's important to engage it for things like sleep and the digestion of food, as I've said, but you don't want to be spending all of your time in that state either. So that's where the delicate balance comes in. And is it done through sort of a sense check? You know, I mean, 
can people respond to how they feel by eating certain things? Um, and we'll come on to some practical examples in just a moment. But 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 it is, am I am I right there in thinking that is that the best way to almost be, as you use a, as a barometer of of this? Is someone's feeling drowsy, tired, low mood? They should you then therefore turn to a certain type of food compared to somebody who's maybe feeling anxious, agitated, could eat a different type of food that has certain qualities. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So people are predisposed to particular illnesses because of this balance that I'm talking about. And different symptoms and illnesses are associated with being dominant in one branch or the other. Um, and that gives me clues as well as lots of other insights into their physiology and personality profile and other illnesses that they might have suffered over the, the years, such as allergies, asthma, they all give insights. Even body shape gives insights. Um, and then, yes, by using very specific nutrients in food. Um, can you hear me OK? I've noticed I'm frozen. You're frozen, yeah. but we can hear you just fine. OK. Um, by using very specific nutrients in food, we can reflex tune their system back into balance. Uh, and so, so what about this? So, so, for example, if somebody was to eat carbs in the morning, uh, which a lot of us do, cereal, for example, um, what impact is that going to have on our autonomic nervous system? Um, and and and. If it's a negative one, I mean, I could imagine the automatic re response for us would be to to drink coffee, for example, if we're feeling tired in mid morning. Uh, what's happening there? Um, you know, because I sometimes get that if I eat cereal in the morning or just some toast, it fills me up for a couple of hours, and then um, come eleven o'clock, I'm feeling tired or not, not so much tired, but just hungry. I get that kind of sense that I need something to pick me up, so I'll drink a coffee. Um, is that is that a pathway to good mental health? Um, everyone's different, but um, I try and make some general general uh, generalizations. You would normally tailor this to the individual, understand? Yeah, as a kind of right. a, yeah, as an as yeah. an example, just for to kind of yeah. bring this to life yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So so what you're saying is is very relevant because um, I would imagine where are we? Uh, just after 10 o'clock and people have had some form of breakfast this morning and the way that the Western diet is typically organized and promoted, a lot of people will have had, like you say, a carbohydrate based breakfast. Now carbohydrates metabolize as sugar and sugar alerts and engages the sympathetic system, the fight or flight branch of our autonomic nervous system. So what happens is after you eat a carbohydrate based meal so let's say for breakfast cereal white toast it creates a cascade of hormonal reactions and uh, that's because it's a it metabolizes as sugar as glucose in the body and typically that will last for 60 to 90 minutes so you'll get some form of energy to your brain and your nervous system but then very very rapidly your blood sugar levels drop and it actually sends a distress signal to this autonomic nervous system, which is what gets you reaching for that coffee. So you'll perhaps interpret it as hunger, but for the body, it's a distress signal. Its blood sugar levels are low. And what this sets up is a cycle because you can imagine you reach for something, even if it's say a latte or you know a coffee, milk-based coffee, you've got lactose, you've got sugar in, in that milk and that sends the cycle off again or you might grab a biscuit or whatever so this sets up this cycle of blood sugar imbalance where you're yo-yoing and what it doesn't do it doesn't satiate the brain and the nervous system properly and something that's been attacked for 70 years since the mid 50s are fats so we all know that there are lots of unhealthy fats but there are absolutely essential fats. You know, saturated fat gets a terrible name, but the brain needs it. it the brain needs all kinds of fats. It needs omega-3 fats. It needs uh, saturated fats as well. So instead of a carbohydrate breakfast, especially when you're thinking about satiating yourself from the beginning of the day and you're going to work and you've probably got a lot of stress going on, the brain needs to be fed with 
with healthy fats. Now that would vary according to where someone was on the autonomic spectrum. So I would advise somebody differently whether they need to increase their intake of plant-based fats or animal-based fats according to which branch that they're dominant in. So it has to be tailored. But, um, and I give some people some, something that's quite a nice, easy starting point for people without having to do too much investigative work of, of their autonomic balance is I've got a smoothie recipe, um, which is pretty good for everybody. And, and it's laden with both healthy animal and plant-based fats. And it keeps you going for six or seven hours. So it's a complete revelation for people because they're used to getting hungry at 10, 30, 11, whatever, and just clawing their way through to lunchtime. But you know, you can satiate your brain and your nervous system a lot more effectively. Is by that just, a it smooth, fat. just a smoothie to, as your breakfast? Just, correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll tailor mine according to how I'm feeling, but that smoothie is a really good sort of baseline for most people. And the brain is made up of 60% fat. And the, you know, you'll, you'll, I'm sure everybody knows a little bit about um, a neuron. They're, they're pretty critical and they're insulated by fat. So the degree to which they communicate with each other, the speed and efficiency at which neurons communicate with each other is partly dictated by an insulating layer made of fat. Now, if you starve your body of fat, then where's it going to get the nutrition from to be able to carry on those insulation. So gray matter is, that's why it's referred to as gray matter versus white matter, because the difference is ones that are insulated and ones that aren't. We're now getting really visceral now into the inner workings of the body. But the term gut health is one that, that many of our viewers will already be aware of. And it's actually a, an awareness piece that has grown in recent years. And, and it's all connected to that, isn't it? You mentioned neurons, but, but actually our neurons they feed into our gut, don't they? Um, you once mentioned a stat, about how, how, how many neurons are there in our, in our gut compared to, a, is it a cat's brain? That's right, yeah. So you, you've got actually got more, um, more neurons in your, in your gut than a cat does in its brain. And you know, I think we're only at the top of the pyramid on, on this actually, but what we already know is the microbiome, people be pretty familiar with that I imagine now, is critical in both physical and mental health. And a lot of us have had the diversity of bacteria in a microbiome stripped out, some partly because of antibiotic use, which are the people that, you know, my age and older, I guess, they were thrown antibiotics at when they were kids like crazy. It was a it was a typical response from doctors that's sort of becoming people more aware of now, the dangers of their use. But the lack of diversity in food now is having an effect too. So we used to have a hundred strains of wheat and now we've got ten. And the different proteins on those wheat affect the diversity of bacteria in the gut. So I'm sure people are aware of things like leaky gut or autoimmune disease. Well, these all begin through uh, inflammation in the gut lining. So it's really critical. So irritable bowel syndrome, that, that yeah. kind of thing, um, yeah. um, and and has a huge impact on our, on our mental health and, and, and association with, with, with our diet. Yeah, well, one of the seven doctors I, I talked about, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, he actually referred to leaky brain. So that's mm -hmm. where the leaky gut inflammation becomes systemic and the body will respond by releasing things like cytokines and the immune system goes into overdrive and that inflammation can cross the blood brain barrier. So there's been whole books written about the inflammation model of mental illness. So that's part of the mix. And cytokines are connected to exercise as well, and physical exercise, and, and the right. reasons why, yeah. um, and, and and the matter that is is built up in our bloodstream, I believe. Um, so so look, we're getting very very scientific here, and yeah. and 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 I really advise uh, or suggest to to our viewers to check out Matt's website take part in his course as well as, as a really good way to, to to get more info about this and please do ask your questions as well because we will be asking Matt some questions from the audience and bringing Carl back into the discussion towards the end um, but before we do that 
I, I'm wondering about, I mean, this sounds all very, very empowering. You know, if, if, if we as individuals get access to, to this kind of understanding, this kind of knowledge, we can, as a, by way of prevention, help support good mental health. Um, and obviously there's going to be cases out there where people are going to need to support professional help. That's not, that's not necessarily what I think we're saying here. I think what we're saying is, is that better understanding can therefore lead to uh, a, a better likelihood of an outcome for yourself um, and maybe your employees if you're if you're educating staff or uh, an insurance provider if you're providing information on how to to look look after uh, policyholders or plan members so how do we measure it Matt uh, traditionally you know we've used pharmaceuticals and other forms of um, of treatment for mental illness but is there a biomarker for something like um, mental illness and, and how do we track someone's um, their autonomic nervous system, for example, or, or, or gauge what good mental health looks like? Yeah, so it's a really important point. And I draw the comparison with physical health. So for instance, if you have a bad back, you know, you'll soon get alerted to it. So a herniated disc, for example, creates inflammation and you'll soon feel the pain associated with that. So you can investigate with an MRI uh, for example, to get a picture of what's going on. But with mental health in the traditional sense, there's no biomarker. So if you're, like I said earlier, homeschooling your kids and trying to juggle that with um, doing your job, you're typically not going to know at any one point in time how you're coping. So there isn't a test for that. Um, and even if you were to visit your GP because, say, you were starting to feel anxious or depressed, they can only ask you to fill out a questionnaire. You know, there's no test available to that for that like there is um, with physical health. But this nutritional approach is built upon a scientific framework. And when you've learned it, you, you do become empowered because it gives you the knowledge to identify how you're doing. So then you can respond appropriately with the corresponding foods and nutrients. And if you do want a physical biomarker, you know, we can go there. So one thing that gives you a very, very accurate insight into this autonomic nervous system is blood pH. Now this gets pretty scientific, so I mean, I'm not gonna go into it, but um, it can be used as a preventative measure in that it gives you an idea of where you're dominant on which branch by whether your blood is alkaline or acid. So you know, this would require a systemic change in the way that doctors work because you know there isn't a home test for blood pH, but it is a very accurate way of working out whether you're dominant on the sympathetic or the parasympathetic branch. Because some people run too acid and some people run too alkaline. And this is where food comes in. So if someone's too acid, I feed them alkaline foods or alkalizing foods and vice versa to bring them back into balance. And I just had a question come in from, from the audience asking, are, are you saying that all carbs are bad or do they just need to be balanced with proteins and fats? No, I'm not sure, all carbs. Just on, on that as well, I'm sure there's some, some vegans and some coffee addicts out there that are watching this saying, uh, how, how, you know, how can I do this? Yeah, no, it's refined carbohydrates that are the problem. So another one of the seven doctors that I alluded to, Dr. Weston Price, he went around the world in the 30s and lived with traditional tribes for eight years and documented, photographed and wrote thousands of pages of his experiences. And what he found was, um, this was across five continents and 14 different countries, and speaking to their doctors and getting a really good idea what was going on, people had absolutely perfect physical and mental health where the Western diet wasn't available. But he stayed with these people for long enough to see their descendants move into the towns where the Western diet was available. And what he found was there, were, there was a, a list of foods that were creating mental and physical decline. And they were the refined foods so the carbohydrates it's the refined white flour based products so white bread white pasta white rice jams marmalades canned foods sweetened foods fruit juices so 
vegetables are carbohydrates, but they're a whole carbohydrate. Um, so they're not the problematic inflammatory foods. So vegetarians needn't worry in that respect. The only note I'd make about that is certain vegetables suit different people. And that's because different vegetables are to degrees of alkalizing or acid forming. So for instance, a leafy green vegetable like spinach and kale, they are green because of their presence of chlorophyll. People know this from school, but the center molecule of chlorophyll is magnesium and magnesium inhibits the sympathetic nervous system. So that's great for people that are dominant on that branch, but if you're already if that branch is already weak, the last thing that you want to be doing is suppressing that branch further because it'll knock you further out of balance and make you more ill. Now, people can unwittingly eat what they think is a healthy diet for years or decades. In fact, I've got clients that have done just that, thinking that they were doing the right thing. And they come to me sick with a whole multitude of mental and physical problems. And sometimes it's hard for them to get their head around some of the recommendations because they think that they've been eating healthily because typically there's in the mainstream narrative around food people never talk about personalizing diet if there's a new cookbook out or a doctor suggests what food to eat it's typically x or y is good for you so there's a big vegetarian movement at the moment and that's great for some people but for some people it makes them really ill it sounds um quite simplistic to say this food is good for you if everyone's different you know having a broad brush approach and, and it's not necessarily one size fits all um no, it's not. yeah uh, so how can you test somebody's um autonomic nervous system or to find out what it is that what, what, what bracket they fall under so i have a 90 say 97 question assessment online assessment so that's the first thing if someone engages with me that's what i do with them through my consultations and then off the back of that, plus spending a decent amount of time in consultation with them, I can identify it through, it's just experience of knowing now your average layman, when they go through my course, which is about four hours, I teach the science and then the practical application of this so they can get to know by dialing into both their health history and the way they feel, whether they're good sleepers, bad sleepers, whether they're better in the morning or the evening. Do they have eczema? Do they have other skin problems? Do they have asthma? Um, do they easily put on weight? Do they burn off most of their calories? You know, all these are indicators that I teach people. And then you can dial in and go, OK, well, that's where I sit then. And then apply the foods that I outline in the course and the natural supplements to bring yourself back into balance and regain health. Yeah, we've had um, a couple of comments uh, come through. Someone, someone said, uh, very interesting insights. I'm curious though, what is the smoothie including? Um, yeah, can you quickly <laughs> give us a rundown of what's in the, the magical smoothie you mentioned? I can post the link if I'm clever, can't I? Um, I'll do that. A, bit, a little bit later. Um, so at the base of yeah, the base of it, you've got filtered water, and then you've got a balance of animal and plant fats. So there's, and I, I'm very careful about my ingredients. So I source grass-fed butter, for instance, and I'll turn that into ghee by get, getting rid of the um, milk solids. So, but without going into detail about that, you've got ghee, you've got organic cocoa powder, um, coconut oil, almond butter. I have, I add, not everyone does, I add two raw organic egg yolks, some like Rocky, um, and a <laughs> banana, but it's a green, so that it's not, there's not too much sugar in there. So I have organic green bananas, which I keep in the fridge because it slows down the process of them turning into sugars um, and then there's a couple of little bits you can do you can add collagen for extra amino acids so that that's the core and then you can go and kind of tailor it a little bit but it's absolutely abundant in natural fats and it tastes like um, chocolate milkshake there's no milk in it <laughs> that's 
that's quite a, that's quite a promise. It tastes like it's quite chocolate. An incentive, isn't it? <laughs> I got everyone then. <laughs> yeah, especially with the the egg yolk and uh, but um yeah, I mean we we, we were happy to to, sh to share um maybe that link somehow um either in the follow up comms or during the during the discussion. Um, someone's asked where can an individual nutrition guide be sourced, and I suppose the obvious answer is a signpost to your um your your course on online. Yes, I mean this information. Um, if someone kind of wants to learn it on their own, this took me five years to pull together, and the course is a summary of all of that work. So that's the easiest place. There's no real sort of shortcut, as it were. You know, you've you've got to go into some detail to understand your own biochemistry, um, which isn't as complicated as it sounds. But once you've done that work you're empowered for, for life um, and you can overcome all manner of illnesses, all sorts of complex illnesses as well. And before we bring Carl back into the discussion, I just wanted to ask you a quick question about willingness, um, because this it sounds like, like you just described, it's, it's not straightforward, you know, in order to, um, especially when it comes to severe mental illness, for example, um, it, it, there needs to be a sense that somebody, from your experience, have you found that there is often needs to be a sense that somebody is struggling or um, suffering in some way before they even make contact with you to, to talk about this sort of thing. And what I'm getting at here is, is that when can we start that awareness piece and, that, and, and encourage willingness at an earlier point? So no doubt there are some simple pointers that people can take on board, simple changes they can make, because once... What I'm hearing here is a bit of a radical change in perspective. You know, that we, you know, we've had a, you know, a previous traditional view of the world where uh, everything is put into quite simple boxes. But actually, there is a lot more science there to understand. But there are no doubt going to be some quite straightforward, simple things that people, changes people can make that will benefit yeah. them from today. But however, there needs to be a willingness there. And we've had this conversation already about well-being in the past across the industry multiple times is, is, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Ultimately, you can tell someone to, to eat better, exercise more, look after themselves, live longer, be healthier. But, uh, but they've got to want to do that first, yeah. right? So what, in your, what's your take on that when it comes to willingness? Do many people come to you and say, hey, Matt, I'm feeling fine, but I want to make sure I stay that way? Or is it more the other side? It's I'm really suffering, I'm struggling, I need some help. Most of it is people are struggling. Um, a lot of people have been down all the roads of psychiatry. You know, I work with people all over the world and I get a lot of people coming to me from North America, and especially the US, and they, no exaggeration, they will come to me having tried 20 different antidepressants um, over a period of time, and they might be on six at any one time. So unfortunately, yes, we're still in a reactive culture. However, that's really the work I'm trying to do by doing things like this is to tell people that this can be used as a preventative model. You know, the natural order is not illness for humans. Dr. Weston Price proved that um, 80 years ago. When people eat the right foods, they are healthy, they're not ill. And by learning the approach, you can stay well rather than getting ill. And as I say, that that's both physically and, and mentally. So yes, it does take personal responsibility. And some people do not want to give up pizza and Coca-Cola. And that's their will. But they're the people that are going to end up with Alzheimer's, I'm afraid. Um, and psychiatric disorders. So it does take personal responsibility and I see a direct relationship between the degree to which people engage and their outcomes. You know, there's phenomenal outcomes amongst people that understand, you know, go, go into the model and understand it. I've got one lady who she literally fine tunes her diet on a daily basis according to how she's feel, feeling because it's the people kind of in the middle, they're called balanced metabolizers, and that kind of suggests that everything's great, but you can be balanced and have both branches of your nervous system weak, and those people can often be some of the sickest. 
and you can swing both ways, um, which is what bipolar is. That's what bipolar, which my father is actually bipolar. So at any one point in time, if you want to excite your neurology, speed up your neurotransmission, you know, this, this client of mine, she knows how to do that through the nutrients in food. And equally, if she can't sleep and she's feeling anxious, she knows what nutrients and supplements to take to calm her down. So if you get to the point where, you know, you, you learn it and practice it, you can have complete control over your health on a on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really going taking the 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 adage that our industry has become more aware of in recent times is that we all have mental health, and it's taking it to a whole new level. You know, this is all connected on such a deep level that I think many of us had, had definitely not previously understood. Uh, I certainly didn't before speaking to you, Matt. Lots of great comments coming in. I'm, I'm going to bring Carl back into the discussion. I'd love to hear from him. Um, Carl, uh, as, as no doubt you know, is the Advisor Development Director for, um, for Vitality. So, Carl, listen to the conversation and, and hearing Matt's uh, wealth of, of scientific knowledge and, and, and personal experience. Um, how do you feel like the, the health, and, uh, health and protection insurance industry in particular can learn from this? And, and how far do you think can, can uh, us as a provider and also maybe even advisors take this further potentially? I think, um, I mean, it's, you, you sort of touched on it, the, the link between nutrition and physical health is quite intuitive. People sort of, un, broadly, we understand it. And it's taken, it's taken the government a long time to get to a point where people sort of understand, oh, I should probably walk 10,000 steps and I should probably eat five pieces of fruit and vegetable a day. What is not understood, as you say, is this link between our mental health. And that was really interesting, Your that last question that you had there about we're all, I guess we're all looking for a shortcut about how can we try and explain that to our customers in a way that is simple for them to understand, that doesn't get them lost in science, that engages them in a way that they want to do something about it. And I guess what we've got to do as an industry is find ways of taking, you know, which is quite, it is quite a complex matter. And there's, there's some really detailed um, discussions that you've talked about here, Matt, that, you know, you take a number of years to get to the place where you're an expert and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we've got to try and do is with our advisors is how do we how do we package that up into things that are compelling and simple and, in, and intuitive for customers to make small but tangible differences to their lifestyle and maybe i can turn that question back to you matt is you know that things like for example eating five fruit and vegetables a day do you think that is helpful as a principle or is actually does that just confuse people because actually which five should i eat yeah <laughs> It can be a disaster for some people. So it, people like me who are prone to depression, if you eat citrus, you're going to get worse. So it isn't simple. Um, it's simple when you've got the knowledge, but yeah. no, just saying to people eat, eat five fruit and veg a day is not helpful. Um, unfortunately, it's more complicated than that. You know, you can even send people, you can, you can give people a bloodborne cancer. So someone like me who sits on that um, parasympathetic branch, bloodborne cancers are experienced by people that are what we call parasympathetic dominant like me. If you eat citrus, it pushes you further out of balance and through a, to a complex um, process that makes you prone to things like lymphoma, leukemia, myelomas. And similarly on the other way, if you push someone, say you gave someone loads of grass-fed beef, which is very acid forming, and they were already leaning the other way, you can develop tumor-based cancers. And I know people personally in my extended family, and I have regular calls with cancer patients, that a lady who cured herself of a tumor-based cancer by adopting this approach through one of the, not through me, but through one of the doctors that preceded me, her, for simplicity, she fed her husband the same diet. Well, unfortunately, he lent the same way as I do, and he got bloodborne cancer. So he had then to go and see the same doctor and say, look, I've got this problem now. And he had to reverse the, the direction of his diet to bring him back into balance to address his bloodborne cancer. So you can see just by that example, it's very complicated. So to, to, to say to someone, just eat loads of fruit and veg is naive at best. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I, I just had another question, if I may. 
Yeah, sure. It's just, just, just one sort of personal question. I'm sure me, like a number of the people listening, um, historically worked in an office. Now we've been working at home for over a year and there's a tendency to find some snacking as in a way to break up the day long team Zoom uh, fatigue that we all have. And I know personally, I quickly run down for a couple of biscuits and sometimes just for something to do. Do, do you see, you know, do you, do you, have you seen the impact of that on mental health and mental sort of well-being where, where people are just, I guess, unhealthily snacking during lockdown? Yes. Um, and it goes back to the point earlier about about 90 minutes after having your cereal. You, you're going to be hungry like you can't avoid being hungry. So then you go for something simple, easy because you're working. And typically those foods that are available like that and that have been, let's face it, marketed to us uh, to a great degree are going to be the ones you reach for. So instead of those, then once you know what's kind of good for you, grabbing a handful of almonds would be a far better support to your nervous system and to satiate your brain yeah. than a biscuit would be, for instance. But we don't know what we don't know. I mean, that's the crucial yeah. thing here, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And obviously once people know, the, it's not the, people's the fault. Yeah. yeah. And once it's there is that education, that awareness, yeah. hopefully people will then be nudged towards making better choices. Some great questions. Some of them are quite technical. Uh, one mm -hmm. of them, one person's asked, um, you mentioned using filtered water in your smoothie. Which would you favour out of reverse osmosis water and distilled water? And I have to confess, I have no idea what reverse osmosis water yeah. is. Yeah, there's no per yeah, there's no perfect filtration system. They obviously know what they're talking about because reverse osmosis is actually a very very good form of filtration. So I'd say that is. I mean, if people kind of don't know what these things are and don't have filtration systems on their taps or don't have jugs available, then buying just a decent quality spring water, whether it's sparkling or, or still is a good answer, but it is worth investing in a, uh, in a filter jug at least. Um, some of the heavy metals in water, you know, fluoride gets added. Um, fluoride kills bacteria in the mouth. So, um, you know, we talked about diversity of bacteria before, and so the, the less of that you do, the better. A little bit similar to Carl's question, actually. Um, someone's asked, and it's, it's, it tells they're really buying into the discussion because there's a, a curiosity to this I like. Do you recommend following the diet 100%? So, for example, is pizza once a week and, and following the diet for the rest of the week considered in any way dangerous? I wouldn't say dangerous. It depends on someone's attitude. So I'm very careful because I have to be and I've got a not great genetics in this arena of mental health, having had grandfather, grandmother, father, uncle um, who suffer. So I have to take it very, very seriously. The odd cheat isn't going to help. And there are things that I recommend to people. If you're going to cheat, then you take pancreatic enzymes with it. And this kind of goes on and on. There's all sorts of little tricks you can do um, because pancreatic enzymes pre-digest food, especially all the nonsense foods. Um, and they have um, insulin in them, small amounts of insulin, so they help to regulate blood sugar. So there are tricks you can do. The trouble is, is if somebody has an attitude of, oh, I'll just cheat a bit on the pizza. So I often hear people say everything in moderation, but if you're having beer in moderation, pizza in moderation, crisps in moderation, biscuits in moderation, the diet adds up to junk. So people don't need to get scared. You know, there's a there's a education piece out there to learn the baseline, and then you get to know how you're faring. So, so for some people, one grapefruit, I know somebody, one grapefruit sends them into a three-day depression because it's citrus and they're parasympathetic dominant. Um, for other people, they're really lucky. They've got balanced metabol metabolism and they can get away with more. So it just depends where you are in the in the game really sounds almost like a, a mental health allergy to some to certain type of foods in a way and i probably wouldn't class it as that but it sounds a like that's health, just sorry i missed that allergy, mental health. allergy almost is you, allergy yeah. predisposition predisposition yeah. we're down to the last few minutes there's one question i wanted to touch upon um it might be one for a, an offline discussion because it sounds like it might be quite technical um and the question is can matt comment on female hormone interaction with what he has described more broadly 
um, of the impact of food induced hormones? Yeah, it's a huge area. So there's many ways to go with this. One of the pieces I haven't talked about at all, um, and nutrition plays a huge role in regulating estrogen, progesterone, for instance. Um, but the other piece that I haven't talked about is detox. So a lot of hormone imbalances, and you know, this is a big issue for women, uh, pre and post menopausal. Uh, I have a lot of clients on on this. Um, is that once the liver, especially, has been detoxified, and there are processes I use for this, hormone hormones self regulate. So we live in a very very toxic world, both through water, food, environment, and detoxification is not taken seriously enough. And this isn't just for hormonal imbalances, it's for general well-being, physical and mental. A toxic liver can make you really, really sick. And unfortunately, our livers are overloaded with toxins because of the lives we're forced to lead, unfortunately, with pollution. So yes, nutrients are really important in regulating hormones, and this approach is applicable. But the other part that is important to mention is detoxification. Um, to regulate hormones, and that depend and that can vary depending on on gender. Yes, but I would recommend detoxification for everyone. You know, there's no one on this planet that hasn't been subjected to thousands and thousands of chemicals. And um, I suppose one obvious example that's been brought into the media big time is glyphosate because of film like Dark Waters. Which you might be available, might be aware of. It's a good film. Um, you know, they were fined 10 billion <coughs> by creating, Teflon. causing cancer. Teflon. And, and Teflon, yeah. So it's all, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's yeah, line, it used to line pans too, but runoff from herbicides and pesticides. Right. That in the movie were, you know, the cows were being subjected to the the runoff for that. Um, polluted water. So people are beginning to understand the huge impact that these things can cause cancer, they can cause all sorts of different illnesses. So most people don't know how to detoxify, but there are supplements and physical processes that you can do to detoxify the liver, the gallbladder. Fascinating. I haven't brought, I haven't got the courage yet to watch the film Sea Spiracy on, on Netflix. I'm going to leave that mm. discussion for another day. Um, thank you so much to you, Matt. It's been absolutely fascinating. And, and thanks for, for joining us, Carl, as well.